Welcome to Strength Chat Podcast, presented by Kabuki Strength. Introducing your hosts, Chris Duffin, the mad scientist of strength, Rudy Cadlow, mature athlete and coach, and the wizard of training himself, Brandon Sen. Welcome to Strength Chat with your host, that's right, the mad scientist of strength, myself, Chris Duffin. To my right, we've got our mature athlete coach, lifter. He's over here flexing. We were just talking about uh, his multitude of new world records he sets every time he competes. Um, <laughs> we didn't do an update on your uh, your meat stuff. Maybe we can do that. Uh, to my left, the wizard of training, the one, the only, Mr. Brandon Sin. Brandon, you're hiding behind your mic there. Hello. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, speaking of that, you, uh, you recently uh, did uh, IPL uh, Worlds of some sort, right? Tell the IPL it. Masters Cup in Houston, yeah, that on May 12th mm-hmm. with uh, a couple of our other clients. Uh, yeah, had a, had a good meet. So, uh, yeah, you got, what, best lifter, and uh, what, was your, what was your total? Uh, that's a good question. I forgot. It was 12, <laughs> 1245 or something. 1245. So, yeah, new, world, new world record. Uh, 501 deadlift. Uh, I don't remember what the other lifts were, but not bad for. Well, you got fat again. You're competing in the 220s again as a. Um, still, yeah. No, yeah. I don't know that I'll see 198 again uh, like our uh, guest today. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but uh, you know, not not many uh, not many 220 pound uh, nearly. Well, no, 69 year old man. Yeah. Uh, don't, use next, the, don't use the S word don't, yet. Okay. Don't, yeah, that, that, <laughs> that class comes next year with a whole new set of records to break, right? So, I can't wait to get uh, a year older. That's great. <laughs> Deadlifting 500 plus pounds. So nice, nice. Well done. Yeah, thank you. That was good. Well, I, more importantly, too, I, I don't think a lot of our listeners know your esteemed uh, athletic background as mm, well. Way back. And one particular story that we were <laughs> way back reminiscing way on. Way back machine, yes. Uh, the time that Rudy went to prison yeah so that's a nice segue let's yeah, uh, tell, us, <laughs> tell us about uh, going to prison well i went to prison with a, a bunch of teammates actually uh i was playing freshman football uh at, at uc davis uh, what did you the, guys do to all get in trouble well it's not what we did it's what our opponents said we, we came out for practice on a monday in the middle of the season and we were scheduled to play chico state the, that coming weekend and our head coach gathers us all in the end zone and says, guys, uh, I want you to sit down. i got some good news and bad news for you. He said, Chico got beat by Sacramento State 69 to nothing last Friday, and their whole team quit. So we don't have a, we don't have a game uh, against them this weekend. He says, but I have procured a game for us against the San Quentin Pirates. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're the all San Quentin eight, Penitentiary. <laughs> well, we're all eighteen-year-old, uh, you know, kids. We we don't even know. I thought San Quentin was a like a junior college or oh, something. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> a junior college of sorts, I suppose. <laughs> so then he explained to us, no, it's it's the federal prison, and uh, you know, it's obviously a road game for us. They don't travel, the San Quentin guys. <laughs> so all their games only, are all their games ho- are home games. Only home games. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, so, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at each other and saying, okay, which is the good news and which is the bad news here? We weren't sure. <laughs> but we practiced that week. Of course, we didn't have a scouting report because you can't get in to see yeah. what they're doing. Uh, but it was, it was interesting. We bust down there on a Saturday morning and uh, go through this whole process. This, this guard walks onto the bus. He's looking at us all with this scowl on his face like we're already, you know, like we're prisoners. Uh-huh. We're in trouble eyeballing all of us we get out we line up our bags uh, from underneath the bus he goes through every one of our bags looking for a contraband or weapons or whatever then we go up to the gate and the gate is uh you know with wire razor wire above mm-hmm. and we go through and there's a metal detector to start with and this is before you cross the courtyard to get to the building so uh, we're going through, and everybody's uh, stripped down uh, with all their metal off. But our trainer, Ben Allen, as I recall, he had an artificial leg from a disease he had in high school. He was a great athlete, but he was our trainer. So he goes through, and all kinds of bells and whistles go off because of his artificial leg. And the guards are leaning over with their uh, automatic machine guns, looking down. I mean, we're like, oh, my God, we're so scared. <laughs> We, we get through that, and then we go through uh, another uh, – we approach the building, and we um, 
enter this little antechamber and they stamp our hands with this infrared stamp and put your hand under the light to make sure it's working. And then they put us, they lock the gate behind us before they open up the door to the courtyard. And we're all freaking out thinking, okay, what? I mean, we're going to be sweating. We're going to be showering after the game. What if the... Going to get mistaken We asked the guy, I go, what happens if our, our infrared <laughs> <laughs> runs off? The guy goes, don't let that happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they open up the gate and 40 of us walk out and we've got this assistant warden who's escorting us around through the courtyard. And as we come around one quarter, there's all the inmates and they're all dressed in their, you know, blue... Levi stuff and intimidating looking. How scared and I, were you? I was scared. I was walking with our quarterback, <laughs> Tom Odell. And you were all, we're, we're 18 years old. We're Didn't kids. you play on the line too? Offensive, offensive line? I was an offensive lineman. And I said, Tom, what would we do? What would they do if these guys attacked us right now? Penetrate. You know, I mean, they couldn't shoot because they'd kill us. He goes, I don't know, just keep walking. <laughs> so we walk around and we get into the gym and we walk through the gym and there's guys in there. There's this one guy's name was Tank. He's probably 6'6 six, six or so, uh, 270 or whatever. He had his football pants on, no shirt. He's just cut like it. And he's got a cigarette in his mouth. He's smoking. <laughs> <laughs> we were just, we were so intimidated. We were a much better team. Did you even uh, try and win? We tried to win, but oh. we were so scared. I mean, I remember one time in the first first quarter, uh, the quarterback throws a little flare pass out to John Hesse, our, our running back, and there's the only thing between him and the goal line was me. Uh-uh. I was a lead blocker, <laughs> and he it just clanks off his hands like a brick. You know, he was just so scared to wrap it up. We went through their first, very first offensive play. We come back to the huddle, and I'm in the center. I'm forming up the huddle. I look down, and there's only 10... Uh, pairs of feet. There's only 20 feet there. And I look around and go, somebody's missing. <laughs> I look back and our biggest, baddest offensive lineman, Bob Kaler, was laid out cold. He, had, <laughs> he run into tank. And he got knocked out on the very first play of the game. I'm telling you, we were intimidated. It was the only game that the UC Davis oh. freshman Aggies lost that year. In, I, uh, I don't uh, think they would allow that in this day and age. There's, I, there's know, no colleges going to prisons, are there? Well, you know, now uh, there's no freshman teams anymore, right. so it's everybody plays on the varsity. So the next year I was on the varsity and through the rest of my career. But, uh, yeah, though that was a singularly uh, e- unique experience for us, <laughs> for sure. Well, <laughs> well, it's good to know that you don't always win, Rudy. So yeah. there's, you know, that's, you but, know, there was a time in your <laughs> career that you did lose. So. But the funny thing, if, if, you, if there had been a camera, Instagram in, uh, in those days, to see all of us getting dressed in the in the locker room, everybody <laughs> had their hand up, held over the head, <laughs> so that their hands didn't get wet, get that infrared thing dried off their head. Yeah. <laughs> you want to get in and out as fast as you can there, <laughs> exactly. I, I would think. Anyway, well, enough uh, of the tomfoolery. Yeah, let's uh, let's get rolling with today's podcast. So really excited to have on. Speaking of setting records, uh, we've got on Mr. Bon- ben Pollock, the uh, all-time world record-setting uh, power lifter. Uh, he well, there's a lot of ways you could introduce uh, Ben. He's a he's an author. He's a coach. Uh, he writes for Elite FTS. He's sponsored by uh, several different companies, and uh, just just glad to have you on, Ben. So, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm I'm psyched. I'm a big fan, and uh, glad I got this opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was interesting. Uh, so you recently competed last year. You won the uh, the lightweights on the U.S. Open, and. Uh, um, actually, I was right there on the stage with you for some of those lifts. So yeah. that was uh, that was a good experience, uh, helping with the the knee wrapping and whatnot. But uh, this year it was interesting because you had switched to uh, you'd been basically kind of doing some bodybuilding prep, doing some hypertrophy, dieting down, really focused on this. And then uh, you know rumors kept coming up. Ben's going to be at the, the U.S. Open, and then your name showed up on the list. And I'm watching your training, and I'm like. Just occasionally, you you started handling some heavier weights and stuff like that, but uh, you know it was not very clear at all by like watching you that you really had planned on being there and being on the platform. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, what was going on and and uh, you know wh- how, how that all came about? Yeah, so when I did Reebok Record Breakers last November, even before the meet, you know I was feeling pretty burnt out, um, just so much heavy training. I was really uh, just mentally and physically kind of hurting. And so after that meet, I decided, look, I'm going to take a long break. I was planning on actually taking a full year off powerlifting and, and just focusing on bodybuilding. 
but Ed Koo uh, from Iron Rebel was helping me out with that the kind of transition. And we talked about the U.S. Open, whether we'd want to do it or not. And we kind of left it up in the air at that point. This is last November. Kind of left it up in the air on that point, knowing that, look, if we do decide to do it, you're not going to be 100 percent. But you can always go out there and do your best and have fun. And so that was always kind of the plan. And then um, when it got kind of closer to uh, the Open, I think around early April, I started, uh, I was supposed to finish my dissertation for uh, school at the University of Texas, and some stuff happened there that was really uh, stressful, uh, really uh, challenging, just career-wise, and so I was feeling kind of down, kind of out of it, Nick calls me, and he's like, look, man, I totally understand that, you know, you're you're struggling with this, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's not like you have cancer or something. You got to get your head together and, and get back at it. And we decided that doing the U.S. Open would be a, a great way to do that. You know, like regardless of what happens at the meet, you can go out there and do your best. And uh, the meet environment, you know, being able to be around other lifters, people who train like that, people who push themselves like that, it's a huge inspiration, no matter who you are. And so that that was really, you know, obviously I wanted to win. I always want to win, no matter what I'm doing. <laughs> you're, you're a pretty competitive yeah, person, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I kind of messed up like that. But um, it really did, you know, get help me get my group back, for lack of a better phrase. And so my my training leading up to that was far from ideal. It was it was trash, honestly, as far as the prep goes. I had a plan, but I just didn't follow it well. Because I had so much other stuff going on that I just I couldn't make mental room for training. And for me, the mental aspect of lifting is by far the biggest. You know, I write about that a lot for in all my stuff. And uh, so having that extra stress in my life really, really threw me off my game. But, you know, the good news is with that kind of behind me, I'm, I'm really feeling mentally and physically pretty great and pretty excited about uh, powerlifting, bodybuilding, everything moving forward. So. It worked out for the best. Yeah, it's a, a pretty interesting story because you definitely had like uh, probably the least amount of prep, I'm sure, of any athlete there on the platform over those two days. Uh, and then you, I know you didn't get, you know, maybe what you wanted, but like you still performed really, really well. And, uh, you know, it's just really impressive to see. And, and I definitely, you know, in talking to you that day, I could definitely see the impact of the the being there around those people and the, you know, the motivation and positivity that, 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 that brings about like being there. Um, yes. What, what, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about this uh, experience, like shifting from like you walked off of the biggest stage. So last year you walked off of the biggest stage, you know, performing at, you know, at the absolute top. Uh, and then you turned around did the Reebok record breakers. Like you said, just you you know, you're killing it, and then you switch to bodybuilding. What did you learn or experience during the, the process? I mean, obviously, I always say switch to bodybuilding. You didn't, you know, you know, go through a whole process and, you know, step on stage or anything. But the, the change in training, what did, you, what did you learn and experience from that? So I've always been kind of a low-volume guy since I first started lifting. I prefer, you know, working up to one heavy set and then just kind of calling it, kind of checking out. Again, you know, for the mental aspect, I get really excited about – hitting heavy weights, and then once you're supposed to do the back off stuff, I'm like, yeah, I'll do it some other time. So always been kind of low volume, and obviously for when you're training for bodybuilding, it's pretty high volume stuff. So uh, in terms of strength, I didn't feel like I trained with enough volume for a long enough period of time for that work to actually carry over my top end strength at all. I think had I stuck with it for a little bit longer, it probably would have, but what I did learn through doing all that volume stuff was a lot better muscle activation across the board because that's really a, a central part of, of bodybuilding is learning not only how to use your muscles, but how to use them in the right uh, ways or in the, the right, uh, yeah, how to use them in the right ways. And so, for example, uh, the lateral head of my tricep, I just didn't use it all, just didn't use that, uh, didn't really know how to activate it. And when you are training, you know, you use pretty short motions, but it's really important locking out your bench press, too. So learning to do little things like that, learning to isolate my rear delts, learning to, you know, activate my quads better when I'm squatting, all those sorts of things. And when I say activate, you know, as far as the science goes, I'm not huge into that. Um, but when you can feel like, oh, yeah, I'm pushing with my quad here, it, it makes you feel a lot more confident, a lot more in the groove you're able to handle heavier weights and then you know hopefully your legs get bigger too so that was by far the biggest takeaway i got from it the other thing i think on the dieting side 
Um, it, I I always follow a pretty strict diet. You know, I was on uh, another podcast a while back, and uh, they asked me what my diet was like. And I was like, mm, you know, I eat whatever I want. And when I say that, like, everybody gives me a hard time who knows me because I, I you know, 99% of the time I'm eating kind of bodybuilding style foods. I'm just not tracking any of it. So starting to track it was a really good experience. It helped me to uh, dial some stuff in and, and to control my body weight a lot better. I had, I, I cut, I think, um, let's see, I think I cu- cut about 21 pounds for the, for the Open this past year. And, you know, it sounds like a lot. It's, it's 10% of my body weight, but man, it was an easy cut because I was just so dialed in for that that type of thing at that point yeah i remember when you when you first started saying hey i'm gonna start uh you know doing some bodybuilding training and working on leaning out and i'm like ben's gonna lean out he's got nothing to lean out on like because you're just like you're one of the the leanest like strong guys walking around that there is and then yeah you did just that uh you know like progressively every week you could see your skin just get more paper thin and those those muscles start th- showing through and it's uh it was pretty pretty impressive and uh I, I think you talked about a few times like the amount of carbs and stuff in your diet which is typically yeah. a lot higher than what a lot of people would think so do you want to talk uh since you're actually tracking um a little bit about maybe one types of food macros that sort of stuff uh, just for our audience sure sure so uh, for a long, long time, I've been following a carb cycling type diet. And again, I don't get too much into the science of this stuff. I just know that I, I feel pretty good on that type of, uh, type of routine where on my training days, I'm eating a lot more food and a lot more carbs. And then on my off days, I'm eating less and, uh, you know, pretty low carbs. So that's, that's my general approach. And then when it gets into actual food choices for that, like, again, the term eating clean, I know that gets thrown around a lot. Uh, I'm eating stuff like chicken breast, egg whites, um, uh, lots of green vegetables, uh, potatoes, oats, that sort of thing. So I'm not eating like I don't go to Chipotle. I don't uh, I don't bury my food in barbecue sauce or anything like that. But uh, doing that, I think, gives me a lot more leeway in terms of the volume of food I can eat. You know, when I write diet plans for some of my athletes. They're telling me they can't eat all this food, even though they're on lower calories. And it's just because I try and clean up their diet as much as I can. Um, because, you know, that's that's always what I've done. It's always worked well for me. It doesn't feel like I'm, I've done it long enough that it's just kind of habit. Right. But, so none of that really changed going into bodybuilding. What did change was kind of my macro intake. And uh, so increasing some of the fats um, and decreasing my protein a little bit, actually, because I was going real, real high protein before. And I kind of dropped that down more into the one one gram, one and a quarter grams per pound of body weight range. Uh, again, just kind of allowing myself to eat more food, um, but still staying kind of the weight range that I want to. So, along with some of the some of the things you learned during your transition into bodybuilding, you mentioned uh, the dieting aspect of it. it. Maybe that's starting to work its way into some of your clients' plans and the lessons you learned. But on the training side, you mentioned learning how to really feel your muscles more, feel them contract individually. Yes. How much of that do you find working its way into your athletes' training plans or your recommendations for training? Because I have to imagine there is a little bit of a balance between what we need to do to overload to actually see improvement improvements, uh, but also a balance on, you know, learning that uh, mind muscle connection. So how much of that do you, do you recommend or, or have you seen work its way into your athletes training plans? For me, it's entirely dependent on goals. So I have a lot of guys who, you know, they want to be power builders and, you know, they want to be big and they want to be strong, but they don't really care about competing. For those guys, it's pretty huge. And I'll have them do lots of isolation stuff, lots of high reps until they kind of get the groove of it get the hang of it really, really well. Um, because again, if you're trying to split those two goals, I think being able to really feel your muscles working is huge because it allows you to do a little bit less volume and get more out of it. Now for my people who are strictly strength related, including myself, uh, I, I generally don't harp on it quite as much because like you said, I think for the vast majority of people, overload is going to be the thing. And so sometimes I'll have, you know, individuals who are really struggling to use their glutes in a squat or a pull or something like that. And then maybe we'll do a little bit of it. But for the most part, I just like to use, I like to find exercises that uh, I feel force you to use the target muscles. 
And just doing those on a regular basis, I think, is going to be enough to be able to use your glutes in a squat appropriately or, or, or something like that. But you always get these guys who are super back dominant or super quad dominant, and it's like, man, that's all you're really recruiting here, and, and we gotta we got to diversify that. And so for them, I think bringing a little bit more of that bodybuilding type work can be really helpful. Yeah, and it, it seems like it could be really applicable to the more advanced guys. You know, Not, not only could it give them oh, a yeah. potential break on their joints and even a mental break, as you mentioned, but um, oftentimes some of the worst habits are in the strongest people and, and getting them to, you know, getting them to isolate their VMOs a little more so they can extend their knees a little bit harder or things like that, I, I think could be really powerful. For beginners, there's I think there's probably more of a balance for, like I said, the overload to actually learning how to feel your muscles. But I definitely think that um, the, the quality to which athletes are performing movements should definitely take a pretty high priority because it's not something that really even necessitates any extra training work. Like just, you know, focus a little bit more on, on what you're doing, especially in the accessories. I 100 percent agree, 100 percent. The one thing I'll say is, you know, going back to that mental side, I find that beginners are more often open to trying new things. You'll get a lot of advanced people that are like, man, I just want to squat. Come on now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I, I try to take that into account too, but I totally agree with you on that. You know, Brent, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to weigh in on that too because, I mean, I, I had that experience. It was maybe about two-ish years ago uh, when you were doing my coaching and we, we backed off and did a pretty lengthy hypertrophy block mm-hmm. and I started playing around with a lot of – Belt squat variations, heels elevated, bunch of stuff that uh, in the mix of it. And I've never really been a quad squatter. And I really started feeling my quads come into play over this, you know, three, six month period. And when we came back to squat, I was just a much like I could feel I still was using all that heavy posterior chain, but my quads were really starting to actually be part of my squat. And I came back being a much better squatter, mm-hmm. um, taking the time to do that. So, yeah, that, that's also been my experience. It, it ben mentioned that some of the more advanced guys are somewhat reluctant to try new things. Uh, two examples that I can think of: uh, one of my current athletes, Chris Carmen, owner of Mount Vernon Barbell. I'm going to throw some shade at him here. He'll probably listen to it, so ho- <laughs> hopefully he does. And then I also coach Sean Doyle for his. Uh, um, U.S. Open meat prep last year, both squat right around 900. And both of them, I, I tried to get to do split squats like twice, just absolute zero adherence. And they're like, no, I, why would I ever do a split squat? I'm like, well, they here's, saw, here's they your saw, reasons. Man. I know. I think I Doyle did. tried them once while I was watching him, and he's like, it's stupid. <laughs> Threw the kettlebell down and like went away. <laughs> So, uh, so, so in the bodybuilding, you mentioned two things: of isolation and and volume. Do you mm-hmm. give more credence to one or the other in terms of of identifying uh, that that neural perception of the of the muscle? Is it more the isolation or the volume, or are they together uh, that that creates that sense of awareness? Um, that's a great question. And first, like again, I don't know a whole lot about like the neural connection between muscles and stuff. I think what, how Chris described it, it's like, yeah, your squat is still super posterior dominant, but you can feel your quads working more. That's all I'm really talking about. I can't, I can't get into the science, but for me, uh, I do think that I would tend to lean towards more the volume than the isolation. If I had to pick one, I think they're both important, but if I'm doing a set of 50 on, you know, flat bench press, so by the time I get to 25, everything's working, right? And I can feel my pecs burn, and I can feel my triceps and my lats burning too. But just being able to feel that I, I find is really, really helpful because then the next time I come in and I'm on the incline press, I'm like, oh, I remember how that feels to have my pecs really, really squeezing and really burning on, on bench, and I can do it a little bit better. Um, isolation movements, I think, come in a little bit more when you try the, the volume and it's not working, and then it's like, okay, can we find some type of exercise, no matter how crazy it looks, that is going to force you to use these muscles? And I'm trying to think back to what I was doing for pecs, that finally it just started clicking. And I think it was something bizarre. It was like um, decline cable crossovers or something, where finally <laughs> I was like, oh, that's what my pec is supposed to feel like. Mm. And I think that aha moment is really, for me, what I'm, I'm trying to get at with both those variables. You know, this is an interesting – you mentioned decline uh, pec flies or whatever. But, you know, cable work takes such a bad rap in, like, the, the pure strength community. And I really think that there's 
it, it has its place. You know, maybe not if you're in the prep for a big meet or something like that. You know, you're going to be tapering stuff out like that. But what's your feel on the viability of 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 doing cable cable type work uh, in, in in certain applications? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think you can make a case for any type of resistance training, but I, I really like cables too. I think, uh, first of all, the flexibility that they give you to, to find those kind of weird positions that you might not be able to get in with other types of movements or with free weights. I think that's really valuable. And then also the resistance curve. You know, sometimes when you're just trying to get that last little bit of range of motion, I mentioned my the lateral head of my triceps, right? And it's like, I'm very, very rarely going to harp on this for a powerlifter. But for me, it was a really cool experience just to be like, oh, I can do this, you know, one arm cable push down with like a three inch range of motion. And it feels a lot different than doing this reverse grip push down with a full range of motion or whatever. I think that type of experience is something that's valuable to anybody. Yeah. So, yeah, I definitely agree. You know, I, I and I think I remember you posting pictures of that uh, head of your tricep over some certain period of time. Did you not on your Instagram? Yeah, probably. And uh, there was like you could see some changes, and you were like, "Look at this!" You know, <laughs> this area of my triceps coming out. So <laughs> yeah, and it's like nobody else probably cares about that, but it's like it's a cool experience. And for me, that's a big yeah. part of the reason why I lift is to feel my body doing new things. Like I think to some degree, that's why you want to set PRs, right? You want to feel. What does a 900-pound squat feel like? Um, and so I think that's that's pretty cool and sometimes overlooked. Well, we talked a lot about uh, some of the lessons you learned in, in bodybuilding and how you've transitioned that back to strength training and, and powerlifting and, and for yourself and your clients. Uh, talk to us a, a little bit more, though, about your bigger foundational elements that, that support your actual training philosophy. Um, it doesn't have to get ultra-specific, um, but the, the, the more the better, I would say. But what are some of the higher-level points um, for you in, in terms of your own personal training philosophy? Yeah, good question, Brandon. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think the biggest thing for me um, in my in my training has been learning to use multiple sets of low reps to get that to get some volume base in. Like I said, I'm a pretty low volume guy. So when I say volume, you know, relative to somebody else's volume, it's still going to be pretty low. But for a long time, I thought, okay, you're doing volume training. That means you're doing three to four sets of eight to twelve or something like that. And I find that. For me, for strength, doing you know five by five, six by three, whatever, doing these lower rep sets allows me to a train with heavier weights, b dial in my technique because I can focus a lot better on my technique for a set of three than a set of eight. It just requires less concentration. I can focus more on my positioning, my tightness for three reps than I can for eight reps. I can sustain that. And third, it's more fun. I, I don't like doing sets of eight and twelve. <laughs> so. That combination, I think, has been a big driver of, of how I program my stuff. On top of that, I think that uh, learning to manipulate my percentages from week to week and, and vary my uh, effort that I'm putting in each week, not necessarily volume or intensity in, independently, but together, learning to vary those so that I'm not always beating myself up or I'm not just doing some type of linear progression where I'm constantly trying to add weight, which at my level is pretty difficult. I think those two things together have been huge. And then the third thing is just dialing my technique, and I kind of harped on this already, as much as I possibly can because I have this tendency to, to just want to grind. Like I don't care. When I started lifting, I would put my body in these horrible, horrible positions and just try and like gut these weights up where it's like you look like a cat while you're trying to deadlift and you're doing a good morning instead of a squat. and. And so learning to put myself in a, a more advantageous mechanical position and then practice practicing that over and over and over until it's mindless and I know that I can do it on a one rep max, those three things I think have been the, the most important developments in my training over the past five years since I started competing. Now, six years. now with a, a lot of the lower volume uh, primary training, so talking like your main squat bench deadlift variations, do you ever find that you have to make up some volume in accessories or are you able to just get in, hit your top sets and get out? Honestly, I'm able to do that. I feel like, you know, I add all of these, these little accessories and sometimes they help. Um, you know, I found that adding a little extra quad work is helpful for me because like Chris, I'm posterior dominant. I tend to use my back a lot more. Um, I think that, uh, on bench press, adding high volume tricep stuff, that's been helpful. But for the most part, yeah, man, I'm hitting these, these top sets and then I'm getting out. And when I do incorporate variations on the, 
on the competition list, so things like front squats or things like uh, close grip bench, they're generally just to give myself a little bit of a mental break, uh, so I don't get too stale with the with the regular stuff. Yeah, powerlifting can be exceptionally stale at times, being yeah, three yeah. lifts up and down only. Yeah, that's been a thread that we've had in several different discussions lately. Uh, that comes up, you know, is how to how to keep that mental engagement over time and. And, uh, you know, you hit on, like, that's why you, you plan on taking a year off, too. So Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that's super important. I also think it's important for us, because we have talked about that frequently, to kind of temper that message with, you, at some point, you have to kind of put the work in in order to mm-hmm. deserve those mental breaks. You to know, earn them. <laughs> for, yeah, for the lifters who are kind of just starting out, you know, maybe they're around a 300 Wilkes, they're squatting around four plates, you know. We're not really talking about those guys needing mental breaks. Like, the where Ben and Chris are coming from are, like, these very advanced stages where you really do like burnout's a, a, a real thing that should should be worked around. So I think uh, making sure we're not I, I think softening that's a good, people. That, that's up. a really good point. Right? Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. So with the uh, heavier training, low volume training, are you doing that very frequently to make up for maybe the volume that you're missing? You know, even I, I, I wouldn't even say volume that you're missing because you're probably responding best <laughs> to this. But um, do you feel like you can do it more or less frequently? Um, definitely more frequently. Definitely. Um, I was really surprised. That was another thing I didn't mention when we were talking about bodybuilding, but you know, I was dropping my frequency on each lift down to, to once a week. And I was like, man, these are just going to go in the gutter. And that wasn't the case because my volume was so high. Mm-hmm. So generally, you know, I'm doing squatting and pulling twice a week now for, for strength and benching three or four times a week. Uh, because like you said, each, each session is lower volume. And so when you look at it over the course of a training, uh, training cycle, you know, the volume probably isn't as low as I'm making it out to be. I still think it's lower than most people, but, um, that frequency definitely contributes a lot. Right. And I also enjoy that. Right. Like I enjoy, I I mentioned this before. I enjoy pushing myself hard. I enjoy getting in the gym. I enjoy lifting. And so being able to train with higher frequency is really important to me. I think the point that you made about the lower volume and, and heavier weights uh, of keeping from getting out of form by by going to seven or eight or 12 reps and, and potentially risking injury, I think that's a good point. And it, it kind of transitions to the sort of the tongue-in-cheek article that you wrote on eight ways to keep getting hurt in the gym. Uh, so let's let's talk about that. I mean, I thought that was a, a well-written and clever uh, article that you wrote. Uh, but talk to us about people that constantly try to overtrain and max out on a, a regular basis. You know, I think this goes back to what Brandon said a minute ago about how when you're a beginner, you don't really have these, uh, you don't really need the mental break as much as when you're advanced. I think that also speaks to kind of like your personality type, right? Because I think some people, they kind of, they train and they enjoy it, but they're never that intense about it. And other people have this you know, drive where it's like each time if they're not pushing themselves to the absolute wall, they feel like they half assed it. And so finding a balance between those two things I think is super, super important. But at the same time, you know, powerlifting is this testosterone fueled sport, like and especially you look back at some of the really inspirational stuff, some of the early West Side stuff, some of uh, the the multiply guys who are um, you can watch these videos and I forget the name of the documentaries, but you know hollering, screaming, snorting ammonia, and as someone who does those, right? Like I'm saying that out of admiration. Um, But uh, I think that kind of contributes to this idea that if you're not pushing yourself balls to the wall all the time, then you're not trying hard enough. And in my opinion, being good at powerlifting isn't about trying harder. It's about training smarter. So if you're stuck in this mindset where, look, I have to push myself all out, all to the wall, no matter what, push my body to its absolute limits, or I'm not working hard enough, it's just going to leave you either burnt out or injured. Like, I, I really think there are very, very few people who have the genetic makeup who can train in that style and continually improve over time. Um, I'm, there are absolutely exceptions, right? But they're few and far between. And so I think that learning to back off when you need to and learning to listen to your body is is huge especially for these guys who aren't raw beginners and aren't super advanced they're kind of in that intermediate stage Uh, i think that's a really really important thing to to kind of grasp great great answer thanks 
Yeah, and the the training that you follow is probably a lot of it has to do. I have to imagine with how much you enjoy it and the way your personality fits within that training paradigm. You know, listening to the way you're talking about it, uh, I'm thinking about Chris's training, and you know, the quickest way to demotivate Chris in training is to do anything that's submaximal for more than a single set. So you know, if he has to do <laughs> if he has to do like three sets of six and leave four reps in the tank, like. He's just not going to do it. So um, if there's not like uh, uh, something to push towards or a new new PR or not even necessarily an all time PR, but like, you know, something that kind of excites you to get in and train like it's uh, in my opinion and watching you, it's 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 not really something that uh, I wouldn't say worth your time, but it's definitely not something that you enjoy. Yeah. If there's not enough weight on there to 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 make me want to step up to the bar, I I don't step up to the bar, I Mm -hmm. guess. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I can totally relate to that, and I like the way you phrase it. It's like, if I don't have to really work to lift this weight, why am I even bothering? Right? Mm-hmm. Like, it doesn't have to be a PR, but it has to be enough that like I need to be about it. Yeah, um, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. I'm kind of the same. Yeah. It does seem like uh, right now there's a big trend in at least what I've observed in mostly social media powerlifting strength training of, you know, of volume is very in vogue. A lot of people want to accumulate a ton of submaximal volume, and it's all about you know the hashtag volume boys and you know just getting as much work in as you can, regardless of how heavy it is. You know, do you think the have you observed that same kind of phenomenon? And if you have, do you think that pendulum is going to swing back at some point? to some of the more intense uh, lower duration style training I've definitely observed it 100% um, whether or not people are going to uh, kind of go back towards that kind of low volume working up to a top set or, or whatever the case may be I, I really don't know I, I have no idea I don't really um, I think that if you get too fixated on any one variable variable of your training whether it's you know your rep speed your frequency your volume or intensity, whatever the case may be, if, if you make one of those more important than all the others, I think that your training is going to suffer for it. So, you know, ideally, I think we would swing towards some type of balance where people are using more of a mixed methods approach. But um, whether or not that will happen, I don't I don't actually know. I, I, it's, it's interesting to think about because I've definitely noticed, you know, the, the submax boys and all that stuff, mm-hmm. but I, I don't. I can't explain it. Yeah, it's interesting. I I kind of wonder, yeah, because it seems like every three, maybe two, three years, things kind of shift towards one thing. Like, I remember I was first exposed to RPE style training. I don't really do too much of it now, but I was first exposed to it maybe about five years ago through a small like manual that I read from Mike T. And now, like, um, I, I was pretty interested in now, but now it seems like everybody's doing it. So I kind of wonder, you know, where that's going in the future, but. You know, I guess only time will tell. Yeah, man, I read that same book by Mike T, and I love that book. The little That's blue one? Yeah, the little With the blue Excel one. disc in it, yeah. It was awesome. And I could never make head or tail those Excel files, but, man, I read that book probably a dozen times. Yeah, um, it, it is interesting like to said, see. Like you said, so now it's like everybody uses it, and I don't think they really understand why they're using it or what they're doing it for, and it's like... Yeah, I don't know that you're really getting the most out of this. Yeah, yeah, it should be used with a pr- for a purpose, not just yes. used to be used. And I yep. definitely see that as being a case in some, you know, not a not a blanket statement, obviously. But so um, I, I want to change direction a little bit. Um, maybe we could jump back. I'm sure Brandon's got a lot more training questions to ask. So, uh, but. Um, Give me all of your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> want all of your secrets? Yes. He did mention rep speed, so you might want to come back to that. Um, so uh, you've been going to school for your uh, doctoral, uh, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's got to be, you know, interesting, like, you know, working on a doctoral in a, you know, uh, an area that's kind of pretty related to, like, what you're competing in and also what you're already, in a, in a sense, already working in because you're writing, you're coaching, you're doing all this stuff. How does that change the perspective either way? So your perspective as you work and compete uh, in this field and also, you know, how do you feel that you've got a different perspective maybe of other students in the curriculum that you're that you're with uh, students, teachers, so on um, that that don't have like those life or competitive experiences that you have. So uh, first, let me explain my program a little bit. It's called Physical Culture and Sports Studies. 
uh, which really means it's the history of exercise. So that's what I'm studying. It's a very, very small field. So when you talk about other guys who lift who are in the field, it's like there's maybe five of us. Um, and the rest are interested in something else. Maybe it's ice hockey. Maybe it's you know track and field, whatever. Um, so, in terms of other colleagues in academia, there's not all that many. In terms of my perspective and training, having that holy cow, man, that really um, coming to this program really changed my life with regard to training because all of a sudden I was around a very few number of individuals who had this just unparalleled knowledge of the sport, both training and competing. So when I say that, I'm talking about my training partner, Dominic, my advisor, Jan Todd, and her husband, Terry Todd. And so I'm sure a lot of people haven't ever heard of them, but you know, uh, Jan was... I, 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 I'm, I'm aware of who they are, yeah. Okay. Um, and so it's like, they're, don't get me wrong, they're definitely controversial, controversial figures in the sport, but they've been around it for so long that they have a lot of training knowledge that they were very happy to share with me. And so was Dominic. You know, he got his uh, degree in exercise science, and he um, worked as a, a trainer for D1 football. And, you know, so he was very willing to help me as well. Whereas I'm coming into this program as this guy who's, you know, <laughs> never lifted around ser- people who were serious about it, who knew nothing about technique. I already mentioned how I, you know, looked like a cat when I deadlifted. So being around all, this, all these people who had experience in the field, really um, got me to take a step back and take a, a smarter approach to my training, which has really, really um, helped me. In, uh, and because I'm very much one of those people who feels like they got to push ball to the wall, balls to the wall. So being able to take a step back and be like, look, I need to be smarter about this has really, really helped me. So that's by far the biggest thing I've gotten out of it. The other thing is, I think, an appreciation for the breadth of the history of the sport um, which I think Mike T talks about this too. He talks about how you have to be a student of the sport. And I, I totally agree with that. I think that looking back on the past greats and the past people who you know um, were kind of flashing the pans is is great a great way to learn how to train better yourself. Just like you look at top guys today, right? And you're trying to figure out, oh, what are they doing differently? What can I learn from them? There's 50 years of history in the sport that you can learn from too. And so I think both those things are really really valuable to me. That yeah, cool. That's uh, sounds like an interesting program as well. So that is history of sport is fascinating. But if you look back on the last fifty years of powerlifting and assess where we are today, uh, do you see it changing going forward, or what? What do you what do you see for the future of powerlifting over the next fifty years? Yeah, it's really hard to say because back in the the seventies and eighties, man, it was it was so big where you were getting you know these things televi- televised on broadcast networks and meat sponsored by companies like Budweiser and these like mainstream companies that were interested in powerlifting, and so you really think of that as kind of like maybe the golden age of the sport. But then you look at in terms of raw numbers and how fast the sport is growing and how. Um, man, how many new people are getting interested in lifting? And it, it's hard to say that, you know, that was the golden age of the sport. Maybe we're in it now. Um, so making predictions like that is really, really tough. Um, one thing that I do hope continues is the trend, you know, it's pretty strong now towards raw power lifting, um, just because that's what I'm more interested in. You know, I've never been uh, super into equipped lifting. I was just, so I, I love it. That's getting bigger. Speaking of the history, it just popped up on my, my Facebook like yesterday or something. Somebody was posting a picture of a, uh, um, probably the most famous lifter from Oregon, a gentleman named Doyle Kennedy, and uh, he was the first person to pull 900 pounds. He was from Oregon. Yeah, yep. oh. uh, trained uh, at uh, uh, down in Corvallis, I believe. Huh. And uh, anyway, yeah, Doyle Kennedy's yeah, uh, local. So that's awesome. But um, um, I'll tell you some stories later. You might find yeah. interesting. So there's a lot of local history around Doyle, uh, <laughs> but. Uh, but anyway, they post and, and I'm like, he was like one of the, the, the top like three lifters that was on the ESPN, like on that, you know, like all the stuff yeah. that was going on at the time. And he was the first guy to pull over 900. And like now there's like so many, and, you know, he's a, he was 330 pounds or something like that, you know, big, massive dude. But now it's like, we've got people that pull 900 pounds. Like it's it's a big deal, but like, a yeah. lot, but there's a lot of people that do it <laughs> and a, at a lot less weight. So when you talk about like, you know, that being the, you know, the peak of the sport versus now and like it was for certain reasons, but other reasons. Yeah. I definitely see the differentiation with, uh, 
uh, with that because it's pretty incredible. Some of the numbers people are putting up these days that even three years ago, five years ago, um, God, I remember when I was chasing the all-time record for the squat. Like when I first started, it was like 840. No, it was 815, <laughs> and it had been there for a couple years by uh, uh, one of the Russian guys. I can't remember. Believ? No, it wasn't Believ. It was uh, God. Uh, guy looked like he had no quads. Anyway, huh? Um, but you know those numbers now. That's not even you know you know. That's an opener. <laughs> it's an opener. <laughs> like, <Yep>. Yeah. <laughs> It's just crazy how fast that things have been moving. So, sorry, my tangent there. It's interesting. That's well, that's true. Stupid. That's true with uh, almost all sports. I mean, every every year, in, whether it's team sports or individual sports, something's happening now that's never happened before. It and I don't know that it's, if it's the gene pools getting better or nutrition. But the uh, people are more aware of nutrition or training techniques, but it just seems like across the board, humans are performing better than they ever have. Yeah, pro- I bet it's not the gene pool yet. I bet it's the total number of people just involved people. in it. Yeah, yeah the whole t- the, the size of the talent pool is probably quite a bit bigger than it ever has been, I would guess. But uh, we're kind of running up here on time, Ben, but there's, there's one topic that I really wanted to, to discuss with you. And I think uh, we kind of talked about if we would get into it today because it's kind of nuanced and uh, it, it's hard to get across a lot of the details, especially through a podcast. But um, you have a very unique way of creating intra-abdominal pressurization or, or oh, bracing yeah. during your lifts. So tell us about what you're doing, why you do it, um, and how you kind of came to uh, the way that you do it. Um, so my friend Dominic, who I already mentioned, he kind of introduced me to just using my abs, period. Um, and once I learned to do that, I added about 100 pounds to my squat in a few months uh, because before it was just all lower back. So that, that was the big thing for me. Um, but uh, the process I go through, I think about it kind of in three parts. So there's the, the breathing part, right, the, the generating the intra-abdominal pressure, which essentially comes down to pushing out against your abs. I think most people kind of grasp that part. For me, the, the more difficult part and the, the part that's honestly more important is using your abs to create that neutral spine alignment. So when I think about that, I'm thinking about the upper and lower abs separately. And I think that I'm not 100% sure whether that's just because of my body type and because of the fact that I'd like to rely on my lower back or whether that's something that's applicable to a lot of people. I haven't worked with enough people in person to know whether that's the case or not. But when I go about the motion, I'm first thinking about using my upper abs to kind of bear down um, – on my, on my navel type, almost do like a cable, a standing cable crunch. And doing that kind of brings my shoulders over my hips and it helps me to keep my thoracic spine in the right position because I think, and this is true, I think a lot of times when you guys have guys who are super low back dominant, they'll try to really arch on their, on their, uh, squats and they'll end up, um, turning their back into this kind of like C shape, which is not what I'm going for. I'm going for more of a straight line mm-hmm. from where the bar is resting on my shoulders all the way down shoulders, uh, hips, knees, ankles, all the way down to my feet. This is kind of what I'm going for. So I start out with the upper abs. Then I use my lower abs to pull um, my glutes under my shoulders. And really, I think that cue is equally important to, okay, so I'm using my lower abs. More importantly, I'm activating my glutes at that point, right? I'm squeezing my glutes. I'm keeping them tight. I'm giving myself a good base to, to squat from that's not just my lower back. So once I have those two things kind of in place, the third step that I still struggle to add, honestly, is to, to get that intra-abdominal pressure, not just pushing out against my belt or against my abs, but get it pushing out in such a way that I'm making myself tighter. And this one's very difficult to describe. Um, if people go on some of my site, uh, articles and look at my articles about vacuums or what I've written about vacuums, I found vacuums extremely helpful for learning and do this. Even though you're sucking in with a vacuum, uh, you find if you hold that position long enough, you can really feel your lower abs really start to contract really, really hard. And so that's what I'm trying to do as I push out with my breath, right, against that abdominal wall, I'm trying to squeeze my lower abs even more. And it, it's real difficult to describe in words. Like you said, it's pretty nuanced. But once you get that feeling, you're like, holy shit, you could put a 1,000 pounds on my back and I'm not going to move because you just have this um, extreme, extreme tightness uh, that 
is is huge for me when I'm squatting and deadlifting. I still haven't quite figured out how to use that, or even if I should use that at all on my bench press. Um, but it's been real big for my squat and my deadlift. Yeah, as I as I mentioned, I think this is a it's a very difficult topic just to discuss without you know being live in person. But um, yes. for those people who follow you or follow us and are interested in this stuff, they'll probably pick up on some of it. So I think the biggest places that we are uh, differentiating, and we had a couple of people even ask us to discuss this with you, um, is we're not you know the the stomach vacuum and, and that is is really. Com- creating a ton of compression around the spine via the transverse abdominis. And what we're looking for is more pure expansion from the obliques, lower abs, and really um, being incredibly mindful of where our rib cage position is in relation to our hips. Um, and we're, we're also striving for that ideal that is that um, somewhat neutral spinal position. Yeah, I was really, uh, really quite... Uh I thought that was quite interesting because, yeah, we get this question a, uh, a fair bit because people are like, well, what about Ben's approach? It's completely different than your guys' approach, um, and he's a phenomenal lifter. And uh, Oh, and, and I think I but, might be describing it poorly no, because but I, do you're, not want people, I, I, I do not want people doing a vacuum when they're squatting or deadlifting. I just like that exercise as a way to learn to incorporate your abs while you're breathing in different ways. Okay, that's a really so good – okay, that's a really because that as, separately as you're as you're describing the positioning and the sequence, like I see so much of what you're doing is almost pretty similar, like controlling. I the, think it's almost, c- controlling it's, that thoracic position, locking that in, getting neutral, um, and we actually have uh, uh, the the when we teach the Levitt, it's the, the the exact same thing of uh, using almost a vacuum type position and teaching the thoracic positioning. Again, we don't have people do that while they're lifting. Um, right. Yeah. So understanding yeah, you're I not doing like you're not doing the vacuum while you're lifting is a that's a very no. important point. That's a no no no. That's I a teaching. Definitely, yeah. Hundred percent on the same page. You need to be pushing out that entire time. And like Brandon said, the only thing I don't I don't personally think about my ribcage position. I haven't found that cue helpful. Well, but everything else, trying to push out with the bleaks, everything. Yeah. We're, no, we're, but we're but you're. You're, you're actually in practice. I do something similar sometimes um, with the upper abs uh, with certain individuals. So it's more of you're talking about that, but when you're talking about that upper ab is just another way of controlling the rib cage. You're getting to the yes. same. You're getting to the same endpoint. You're using a different nuance cue perspective to get there, but the same thing is in is controlling all those spinal mechanics um, before you really start incorporating the bracing piece of it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Interesting. And honestly, a lot of the stuff that I got on bracing, I got straight from your video on breathing and bracing, titled Breathing and Bracing. Um, I think you, it's either you or Chad Wesley Smith who has the exercise where you're lying on the ground with your feet against the wall, pushing against the wall, um, and breathing into your into your belly, um, and then breathing out. And that's kind of how I use the vacuum. You're just doing the same thing in a standing position. Yeah. Right? Trying to get your lower back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I definitely think we're on the same page. And I am not good with verbal cues. And so that's why for a lot of the times I have to rely on these exercises instead that help me feel either the position I want to be in or the opposite position that I want to be in. Um, because some will say, you know, bring your ribcage over. And I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's why we, we had the d- discussion about whether we talk about it now. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you as a live person that we were working is to actually, because this stuff is, a, is nuanced and it's hard to go through in discussion and understand, you know, and to, a, to expect somebody, especially in writing. People are always like, when are you going to write the book? And I'm like, Write a book. The I can book. barely. I can barely get the concepts across in video. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> but you work with somebody in person, and if they're struggling, you just put them in the right position. All right, you take your hands on the shoulders. You're like, oh, you need your shoulders here, and then they're like, oh, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah tactile um, cueing seems to be tactile cueing seems to be very effective for breathing and bracing. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. And we do separate what we consider to be IAP and bracing, but that's even a, a much more nuanced discussion that we probably don't want to get into today. But no, that's not a podcast discussion. All, all, all of that, 
all of that stuff is we we consider it strategies, um, especially for higher level lifters, because, um, you know, we all know that bodies work in coordination and that strategy is global. So your bracing is not isolated to just the abdominal cavity. It is a global action that's happening in in your lats. It's happening in your abs. It's happening even in your adductors as a, as a part of hip stabilization. So, yep. you know, bracing is uh, it, one, you know, I think it does start at the at the abdominal cavity, but it's it's a global um, it's a global strategy, and, and individuals will do it differently based on proportions and um, probably other factors. Yeah, yeah, I think we're definitely on the same page there. Well, uh, I'd still, uh, as we mentioned, as I was just mentioning, the uh, getting you out here in person, I'd love to. Uh, yeah. Uh, sometime in the next year, uh, have you out here as one of our in-person guests so we could actually do some uh, some filming and content uh, together. So, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, what else we got for Ben? Anything? Uh, I think we, I think send, we could go we on for a to, while. But we yeah, need to send uh, Ben to Kabuki shirt so that the next time he's on his podcast, he'll have something to wear proudly. Oh, that'd be yeah. Yeah. Anti-fragile shirt yeah. or something. Yeah. So, um, uh, Ben, where can, uh, where can people find you at? Um, pretty much all my stuff is titled PH Deadlift, which is not the most creative name, but I'm not the most creative guy. So, I like it. Um, my website's phdeadlift.com. All my handles on all social media is all PH Deadlift. So, Instagram.com, PH Deadlift, uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook is all, all the same. So, pretty simple, easy to remember, but, uh, yeah. Excellent. And Excellent. There, there's also, uh, if you guys want to do a deeper dive onto some, some of Ben's training methodologies, definitely check out his, uh, on, Fricket YouTube series for our children <laughs> listeners. <laughs> Some really good content out there for if you guys want to do a deeper dive on his personal uh, training philosophies and how he applies it to himself and his lifters. And uh, for all of our listeners, as always, head to kabukistrength.com for all your coaching and movement needs. I'll plug it again. We just added a tools and download section to the forum where you can download some neat excel things for strength and math and doing less math in your head so head over there and check it out all right great thanks ben for joining us today we appreciate thank it thank you all for the opportunity yeah it's been actually a fabulous discussion so looking forward to a fabulous fabulous <laughs> talking with you again <laughs> all right that's a wrap we did it. All right. You want to kill the... Recording? Yeah, thanks yeah. for... Uh, Good job, man. Thanks for talking with us today, Ben. It's been a lot of fun. Oh, seriously, thanks for having me. It, it was a lot of fun. I uh, um, really love all your guys' stuff. I guess I haven't really met Rudy before, but um, yeah, big fan of Brandon, both your stuff and, and Chris, obviously. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, appreciate that. The more that we can put out to help people, I think the better. Yeah. So uh, I'll keep I'll keep in touch with you, and uh, we'll awesome. find a time uh, later this year where we can get you get you up here, and maybe we could actually, yeah, you know, like I said, film some content on some of this more nuanced discussion around uh, movement and whatnot. So I think that would awesome. be um, I think that'd be really interesting. So. You're in Texas, right? Yep, awesome. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yep, cool. All right. Well, All right. I suppose until next time. Thanks again All for right. chatting with us, yep. Ben. And oh, yeah, and, definitely. And I told you I was going to ship you a uh, deadlift bar to test out. So I decided to wait until our production uh, uh, material comes in and not send out okay. one of the prototype ones. So it's going to be about two months this, I would think, um, maybe two, three months, somewhere in that range. Um, awesome. But uh, I wanted to get everything as the full production run material and uh, all that. So, so anyway, that's why I haven't seen anything cool. yet. So I'll yeah. reach out to you and get your address then. All right. All right. Sounds good, guys. All right. Bye. Thanks, Ben. Bye. Bye.